Happy Easter. I'll be reading from the Gospel of John, chapter 21, verses 1 through 14. Jesus and the miraculous catch of fish. Afterward, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. It happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas called Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them, and they said, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, It is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him, for he had taken it off, and jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from the shore, about a hundred yards. When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals. There were fish on it and some bread. Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish you have just caught. Simon Peter climbed aboard and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153. But even with so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, Come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask him, Who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread, and gave it to them, and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. Well, good morning. My name is Mark Lucenius. I'm lead pastor here. Happy Easter. He is risen. He is risen indeed. You've done well. You trained them well. Do you have a scent memory, like a, a, an aroma that draws uh, positive or maybe not so positive memories uh, to you? Uh, maybe it's the smell of bacon cooking, right? Uh, maybe it's, uh, could, could it be the smell of Easter flowers and, and Easter lily? An Easter lily in our house smells like allergies uh, because everyone gets allergic to it. Uh, Maybe it's the smell of a campfire. I love the smell of a campfire. Maybe it's a, a perfume. Do you have a, a memory that's associated with a scent? You know, there's an entire cottage industry around aromas. In fact, there's, there's organizations that will help you build the right aroma for your brand. A hotel's pump in certain scents so that you can associate being in their hotels with a certain kind of smell. Uh, they say your olfactory senses, uh, all this going on up here, is the strongest when it comes to associating itself with memories. Uh, our reading today is a reading of an experience with the resurrected Jesus. And Peter is there, and he is going to come face to face with the smell of a campfire. For me, uh, that might be one of my favorite smells. One of the favorite things I ever did in life is I got to serve as a camp counselor. And one of the things I got to do as that camp counselor, I, when I, actually when I was a program director or whatever it was they called me, I got to cook the chicken every Thursday night. So I'd get there in the middle of the afternoon, hot summer sun, and I'd gather as much wood as possible, build this huge fire. I made a big fire. I loved it. And then I, I got... I got some cement blocks, and we had this big grate, and we laid the, the grate over top of the fire. We spread the coals. they bring out the chicken to me, and I would cook legs and thighs for 150 people. Now, I was 21 years old, so when I was cooking chicken 
I didn't really understand how important it was to cook the chicken, all right? I was just throwing it on there, putting it in some sauce, flipping it around, handing it out to the people. And it didn't, I didn't really care to me when they decided they were going to boil the chicken before they allowed me to cook the chicken. Uh, I just loved the smell. I loved being there. Well, our story, uh, in some ways, uh, that, that J.C. just read, ended with a campfire. And as we read, as we look at this story, we find Peter, who's had an experience of the, has had an experience of Jesus, but is so far from Jesus, and he's going to be able to find his way home. I think there's a lot of people who have experienced Jesus, and, and if you give me the opportunity, I couldn't talk you out of it. But you, but you feel far from him, and you don't know how to get back. We're going to see how Jesus makes the ever so loving and kind extension of himself to help Peter find his way back. Well, where our story ends is they're, they're coming to the shore and there's a campfire. And I'm sure for Peter, the smell of that campfire brought him back to the campfire from a couple weeks prior. Probably the worst night of Peter's life. The worst day, worst night of his life. Uh, it began, certainly, as he was a follower of Jesus, and Jesus was particularly down that day, and he was speaking about the end of his life. He was speaking about how he is going to be betrayed. Uh, he's going to be arrested. He's going to be even crucified. He, 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 brings, he pulls Peter aside. He says, this is so heavy on me. I need to go pray. Will you come and pray with me? And Peter's like, absolutely. But while they're out there in the Garden of Gethsemane, and, Pete, and Jesus is praying as if his life depends on it because it did. Peter's falling asleep, and Jesus wakes him a few times. But, but on the third occasion, uh, Jesus wakes him up, and, and he wakes up to, to see that uh, there's a detachment of Roman soldiers coming to get Jesus. And in front of the detachment is his fellow disciple, Judas Iscariot, who walks right up to Jesus, kisses him, kisses Jesus. And after the kiss... It seems all hell breaks loose as the Roman soldiers come and they grab Jesus. And as they're grabbing Jesus, Peter is grabbing for his sword. And next thing you know, he's lifted that sword and removed the ear of another person. There's blood everywhere. They're screaming. There's an entire mess. And if you could imagine Peter, and I've, I've read this passage so many times, but I can only imagine Peter for the first time having used a weapon to strike another person and causing unbelievable amount of blood. If that was only the thing, the only thing that happened that day, it would have stayed with him for a very, very long time. But thankfully, Jesus was there. He heals the man, but just like the rest of his disciples, they, Peter, they all scatter, for they're afraid of being arrested with him. Peter connects to the gospel writer John who wrote this account and the two of them begin following where the soldiers are going to take Jesus and he goes to a few different places but when he gets to the home of the high priest Caiaphas he's taken into the courtyard in the back and John's got a connection he's able to get in and so Peter's waiting on the outside to get in and then eventually a servant girl comes and gets Peter and allows him to come in but as as Peter's going into the back courtyard where John is, the servant girl asks Jesus or asks Peter, "You're one of Jesus's followers, aren't you?" And Peter says, "No." Now, this is a servant, and this is a servant female at that time. What she thought of Peter did matter. Why would he be denying Jesus? Earlier that day, when Jesus was talking about being denied, uh, being betrayed and crucified. Peter couldn't believe it, and he said, Jesus, I will lay down my life for you. But Jesus knew what was going to happen and looked right back at Peter and said, Peter, before the rooster crows, you're going to deny me three times. Well, this was the first with the servant girl. 
And, and there's Jesus, and they are, all the uh, leaders are trying to debate as to what to do with him or how to get him killed as they intended. And while he's there, there is a campfire. And the smell of that campfire, it's sort of the middle of the night, and Peter, like the others, go up to that campfire to keep warm. And while he's doing that, uh, some of the others around the campfire, they say, you, aren't you a follower of Jesus? And Peter says, no, 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 I'm not. And it wasn't a short time later till a relative of the man whose ear Peter lopped off comes up and says, yeah, I've seen you following him. You're one of his followers. And, and Peter vehemently says no. And in fact, in another, in another uh, version of the gospel, he calls on curses on himself to declare, make it really clear that he doesn't know who Jesus is. And as he does this for the third time, the rooster crows. He immediately looks at Jesus and Jesus looks back. What Jesus said would happen is exactly what happened. Peter rushes off in a heap of tears, and Jesus is then led to his execution. The last thing that Jesus heard from Peter before his death was Peter's third denial. The last thing Peter saw of the living Jesus before his crucifixion was the broken heart in his eyes. Well, as you know, the story goes on and there, there's, Jesus rises again on the third day and he is seen and Peter sees him. Peter sees him a second time. Uh, but, you know, life goes on. It's a few weeks later and Peter needs to figure out what he's going to do with himself. Well, what do you do, right? This whole following Jesus and building his kingdom is well, that's clearly over at this point, right? So at the beginning of the story, uh, Peter and his fellow followers have left Jerusalem. They've gone back to their home. And he tells his friends, he says, guys, I'm going fishing. He could have said, I'm going back to fishing, right? Because that's what he was before he met Jesus. He was a fisherman, and he was going to go fishing. And since Peter is ever the leader, six, of the, six others of the disciples go and follow him. And there they are, uh, professional fishermen as they are, all through the night. And they are not getting any fish. Nothing's coming up. Nothing's biting. Nothing's happening. And you can only imagine what that was like for Peter. Out there, trying to get back to something that he knows in utter disappointment. I, uh, I read a quote recently that talked about the most significant emotion experienced by Americans well, it's disappointment. The, the emotion that more Americans experience than any other, and it's particularly an American thing, is disappointment. And you can imagine Peter disappointed in Jesus, right? Because they were going to build a kingdom together. Utterly disappointed in himself because he didn't trust in what his leader was going to do. Utterly disappointed in himself, utterly disappointed in Jesus, and probably particularly disappointed in his government, and particularly disappointed in his faith leaders out in this boat. You might even say it's the boat of his disappointment. I think there are a lot of people who had an experience of Jesus, uh, but their disappointment has just made them feel really distant from God. Disappointed in what they expected from life, disappointed in themselves, disappointed with the other realities of life. And what can happen is we can find ourselves in the dark, isolated, in this boat on our own, not knowing how to get back to God. 
There's different ways we experience that disappointment. One of the boats of disappointment, you might call them, is the, is the boat of busyness. If I stay busy enough, then I won't have to slow down and actually feel my disappointment. For some of us, we get a whole bunch of people who think like us in our boat with us. And if we can, if we can figure out how we're right and how everybody else is wrong, we don't have to deal with our disappointment. We can just blame everybody else for it. Unfortunately, a lot of churches do it that way, right? Uh, churches build a sense of community by saying, what's really wrong with this world are the libs or the woke or the fundies. We're the ones that are right. We're the innocent victims. And if, every, if people would just know what we know, this world would be better, right? And it's funny, as they create enemies of other people, they become so distant from Jesus who's called us to love our enemies. One of the ways we build, build boats of disappointment uh, for ourselves is just by isolating. We isolate because it's just easier to not let somebody get close enough to see our disappointment because if they see our disappointment, then we need to deal with it. For some of us, that boat of disappointment is just disappointment in church, right? I really like to have Jesus, but as long as I don't have to deal with people that are different than me or actually have to change my life, I'd, I'd like to have a, a Jesus of my own making. But even then, Jesus ends up becoming a mascot and not anyone who could actually help us. Peter was dealing with his disappointment, and I can only imagine him there in the dark, fishing away with his nets, continually coming up empty. And to add insult to injury, having been there all night, well, he hears that rooster crow again. You know how scents have memories? Different sensations have memories. And it can only have brought up just the scarring memory of that night. But this time it's going to be different because the last time he ran off in tears, this time when he hears the rooster crow, there's a daybreak that follows. And with that daybreak, there's a man on the shore. Nobody knows who that man is on the shore. But in those days, sometimes you could see the fish differently from a different perspective. And that man says, hey, everybody out there, it doesn't seem like you caught any fish last night. Why don't you try putting your nets on the other side of the boat? Maybe they're tired. Maybe they'll try anything, whatever it is. They decide to do it. And next thing you know, they put the nets in the water. And all of a sudden, boom! The nets are absolutely filled. And, and, and now, they're in, now they're in a battle. they got a couple boats out there. They're trying to wrestle with these nets. And all of a sudden, there's, their nets are filled with fish. The thing that they've been trying to do all night, all of a sudden, has happened. Day is now dawning. There's a man on the shore. And Peter is grappling with what he'd been trying to do all night, finally working. I think Peter, at that time, needed two things. And if you're far from Jesus, I think, like, like I have been at times, we need two things. We need Jesus to make the first move. That's the first thing. And the second thing we need is this. We need a friend to help us see it. Well, there's Jesus making the first move. He had done this whole fish in the nets thing before, but Peter isn't getting it yet. And he's just wrestling with the nets. And all of a sudden, his buddy John, that, he had, fo that had followed Jesus with him, all of a sudden says, it's the Lord. And and, and, and like lights go on for Peter because he remembers the fish in the nets before. He remembers the commission that he had had from Jesus to go out and, and, and not just fish for fish, but to fish for men. All the things clicks. And all of a sudden he, he's like, I got to get to Jesus. And so he, he decides to get out of the boat. But I don't know why he does this, but he, he's just going to get out of the boat and he puts his coat on first. I don't know why he does it. it, it clearly, he, clearly he was just 
just, he was just overwhelmed at the moment. So he puts his coat on, just jumps out, and he still had like 100 yards, like a football field between him and the shore, but he's going to do it. And there he goes. He's probably walking in. Maybe, I don't know if he's swimming, but he's walking in. Of course, leaving the other guys to deal with the fish, right? But there he is. Peter comes walking in, and when he gets to the shore, he finds Jesus. If you have found yourself distant from your Savior, may I encourage you that he's made the first move towards you? He's making that first move towards you. And if I can be your friend, I'd like to say he's, he's right there. He's right there. You can find your way back to him. You can find your way back to him. You can find your way back to the warmth of the relationship that you once known. You can find your way back to the, the purpose of the life that you know that you were called to. You can find your way back to the freeing power to release you from the things that have held you down. You can. Now, it can be a little bit awkward. And I just want to brace you for that. It is a little bit awkward to restart it. Think about what it was like for the disciples. They, they come up and they get to the shore. And they finally get the fish. This is like 153 fish. This is a lot of fish. And Jesus is like, hey, everybody, hey, bring some fish. But like, it's like the resurrected Jesus. So it kind of looks like Jesus, but for some reason they don't know if it's Jesus. In fact, the passage says like they all kind of were sitting there asking, like, should we ask him who he is? But we kind of know who he is. It was kind of awkward. And if you've ever been at a family event where the two most influential people are having beef, that was probably the same kind of awkwardness they were experiencing because they're all, because they're all probably wondering, what's Jesus going to do with Peter? Because they knew Peter was a mess. Peter didn't know what to do. Peter figured the whole jig was up. He didn't know what to do. And there they are. Nobody's dealt with it, right? And it might be that you carry that in your life. Peter was probably wondering what Jesus was going to do with Peter. But do you ever wonder in your life, what would Jesus do with me? Let me see if I can, let, let me read the passage. See if we can see how the story finishes up as to what Jesus does with Peter. I'm reading, uh, reading continuing to read in Matt, John chapter 21. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Uh, yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my sheep. Jesus and Peter go for a walk. They're taking a walk. We know from the rest of the passage, they're on a walk right now. It's just the two of them. And you know the difference between wounds and scars when it comes to an experience that we might remember? A wound is, is sort of a memory that it just it, it impacts us, right? Uh, but it can get better, and we can even forget about it over time. But scars are the kind of moments that stay with us, and they might heal, but when we, re when we are reminded of them, they're known as triggers, and they, they bring up a certain association of those memories. Jesus is not going to just extend to Peter forgiveness. He's going to heal Peter's shame and do what he did for his own scars, redeem Peter's scars. And he can do that for you and me as well. Just think how it all played out for Peter the first time. He denies, he denies Jesus three times around the campfire right before the rooster crows in the middle of the night. This time, 
Peter finds himself kind of trying to figure out life on his own and continues to come up empty. He's coming up empty, probably feeling quite broken. And then the rooster crows. But this time the rooster crows and the sun is coming up. And after the sun comes up, there's somebody there. And then it just so happens to be Jesus. And then when he's brought to Jesus, what does he smell? He smells that familiar smell of the campfire. And then they go for a walk. And Jesus asks him not once, not twice, but three times if he loves him. And of course, Peter's going to respond, yes. If there's any question of Jesus' forgiveness for Peter, Peter was able to, to see it and realize, because not only did Jesus redeem those scars, but he recommissioned him. Each time, he called him to attend to his family, to attend to his spiritual family, attend to the church. Those answers weren't for Jesus. Peter's forgiveness was addressed at the cross. At the cross, Jesus accomplished our forgiveness. So all those who have faith in Jesus have forgiveness from God accomplished by Jesus. It has nothing to do with what we do. What Peter did didn't accomplish his forgiveness. Those answers were not for Jesus. They were for Peter. Because in Peter saying that he loved Jesus each time for each time of his betrayal. He was able to cleanse himself from that shame in the presence of the one to whom he denied. He was freed of those memories. And the number three no longer points to the wound of his betrayal. The number three now points to the redemption of his flaws. Each of the gospel writers will tell the story of Peter's betrayal. And Peter was not ashamed of it. Why? Because just like Jesus' wounds led to his death, Jesus' resurrection has redeemed those wounds. And they are no longer a sign of death, but they are a sign of victory. Peter could go, go forward and live his life free, fully commissioned, now, there's, there's something here that might seem really attractive, forgiveness and freedom. The other thing here to not leave out is the commission. Each time there's a pattern. Peter, do you love me? Yes. Here's your commission. See, our, your disappointment doesn't mean your deactivation. Your disappointment doesn't mean your decommissioning. Just because you're disappointed, which we will experience and we will continue to experience in life, it doesn't remove the commissioning that God has on your life. A thousand years from now, we will look back on this moment. We won't remember election year. The most significant thing, according to the resurrection of Jesus Christ, is that Jesus is redeeming and healing this world and pulling together his people. And that's why Jesus says, Peter, attend to the body of Christ. Attend to my my spiritual family, attend to my lambs, attend to my sheep, take care of them. The calling to Jesus isn't just to return to him, but to return to his family. Not just to return to him, but to return to our purpose of, of bringing all of our lives in alignment with who he is and the way we love, give, and serve, and even care for the church itself. If there are three specific things I could offer you to step into today, first of all is this. I want to be your friend, and I want to point to that man on the beach who is inviting you to come back to him and let you know that he's taken the first move towards you. And maybe if you've drifted away from him or have never begun a relationship with him, I want to invite you to, to restore that relationship with him and to pray a prayer with me at the end of this message. Secondly, maybe you have a relationship with him, but you're in a, you're in a boat of disappointment regarding the church. 
And because of that, it's tough because Jesus, where is Jesus found? Well, he's found with his people. He's with his family. And he's find, found with his family, bringing them towards the hurting and the marginal. And if you don't like the hurting and the marginal and you don't like the church, you're going to struggle when it comes to your relationship with Jesus. So here's the second, here's the second application I want to offer you. I want you to go out and find a pretty good church. Like, don't go find a perfect church because if you, get, you, become, if you go and become part of it, you'll ruin it, all right? So just go find a pretty good church, all right? Uh, if you find a pretty good church, what do you, one of the things you're going to find is you're going to find some messy people there. You're going to find people who disagree with you and who often look differently than you and may, may not be in your socioeconomic bracket, all right? If, when you go to that pretty good church, maybe if you're local, we'd love for it to be 938 church, but wherever you might be traveling from, go to that church and try it five times. And afterwards, hang around and meet somebody new. For five to ten minutes. That's it. That's your second application. Try a pretty good church five times. Try five times. The third thing is you might be in church and you might be having a relationship with God, but you're just feeling this just weight of disappointment. Your life is much more characterized by your disappointment and your resentment than it is the vibrancy of the resurrected Jesus. Can I just invite you just to name those disappointments? Maybe get out of the boat of the people who continue to stir up your resentments, whether it's against this or that, and begin naming that and bringing it to Jesus. And maybe, maybe there's a conversation on a beach between you and Jesus in the near future where you could lay those things down and get back to your purpose of bringing life, joy, and peace to others. Lay down the resentments and the disappointments and get back to the resurrected life that you are called to live for the good of this world. Can we do that? Let's pray together.